Hello, I'm Ron Strickland. This webcast is one of a series in which I'm presenting some brief lectures and commentaries on topics from the courses I teach in literature and cultural studies. This particular installment is the second in a group on the Wife of Ath's Prologue from Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. In the previous webcast, I said some things about the Wife of Bath's critique of patriarchal privilege and the patriarchal hierarchy of the Middle Ages. We pick up the thread at a point where the Wife of Bath is arguing against those who say that a widow should not remarry after her husband has died. However, she comically confuses remarrying after one's partner has died with bigamy the condition of a man being married to two women at the same time. So she cites various examples of Old Testament patriarchs who had multiple wives in defense of her decision to remarry after each of her husbands has died. I know well Abraham was a holy man, and many another holy man also, and each of them had wives, more than two wives. Where can you find, in any historical period, the high God forbade marriage by express word? I pray you, tell me. Or where commanded he virginity? He put it in our own judgment. For had God commanded maidenhood, then had he damned marriage along with the act of propagation. And certainly, if there were no seeds sown, virginity, then whereof should it grow? Where are you going to get virgins? and have sex. I know well that the apostle was a virgin, but nonetheless, though he wrote and said he would that every person were such as he, all is nothing but advice to adopt virginity. By calling the apostle a maid, she's suggesting that he's a virgin. Even more than that, I think she is rhetorically emasculating St. Paul, questioning his manhood. This is the sum of it all. He held virginity more perfect than wedding in weakness. Weakness, I call it, unless he and she would lead all their life in chastity. I grant it well, I have no envy. Though maidenhood may have precedence over a second marriage, it pleases them to be clean in body and spirit. Of my state I will make no boast, for well you know, a lord in his household, he hath not every vessel all of gold. Some are of wood and do their Lord's service. God calls folks to him in various ways, and each one of them has of God an individual gift. Some this, some that, as it pleases him to provide. Virginity is great perfection and continence also with devotion, but Christ, who is the source of perfection, bade not that every person should go sell all that he had and give it to the poor, and in such wise follow him in his footsteps. He spoke to those who would live perfectly. And gentlemen, by your leave, I am not that. I am not someone who wants to pretend to be perfect. Well, tell me also, she says, now just tell me, to what purpose were members of generation made, and by so perfectly wise a workman brought? Trust right, well, they were not made for nothing. Interpret whoever will and say both up and down that they were made for purgation of urine and both our small things were also to know a female from a male and for no other cause. Do you say no? Hmm. The experience knows well it is not so. Provided that the clerks be not angry with me, I say this that they are made for both. That is to say, for urination and for ease, or office and for ease. For ease of procreation, in which we do not displease God, why else should men set in their books that man shall pay to wife her debt? Now with what should he make his payment if he did not use his blessed instrument? How's he gonna pay his debt? to his wife without using his blessed instrument. <clears throat> you have to use your imaginations. <laughs> then were they made upon a creature to purge urine? 
small things are made for men and women. Also, okay, so you can go to the bathroom with these things, but also for procreation. Okay? That's the deal. Then, she gets to Genesis, and we'll come to this. Um, God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply. Genesis, uh, verse, chapter 1, verse 28. Replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. She fastens upon this text, which seems to contradict um, St. Paul's prescription, St. Paul's advice, that you shouldn't have sex. Here's God directly saying, go have sex. So to sum up, Chaucer uses the Wife of Bath's prologue as an opportunity to present a critique of the patriarchal order of medieval society from a woman's perspective. In the first part of her prologue, the wife of Bath has engaged a sustained argument with the Christian church's tradition of support and defense of the patriarchal hierarchy, the dominant position of men in society. In another webcast, I'll look at the wife of Bath's description of her own experience in five marriages, the conflicts and tensions that arise between husbands and wives and her efforts to assert some control, some agency within the institution of marriage. But for now, I'll conclude this webcast. As always, if you have questions or comments, send me an email.